Most recently, you will know me, a, another bestseller in your world. Congratulations, Thank first you. Of all. Thank you so much. And welcome to our set. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. Now, this is a really interesting book. Uh, it's a book about a gymnast, a prodigy, someone who has become uh, absolutely committed to this sport and her parents, and it's actually told from the point of view of the mother. I'm curious about the idea of prodigies to you uh, uh, in terms of writing crime fiction around that. Where did that come from for you? Well, I was always interested in the way of it makes a fam family power dynamic shift when there's a very special child and sort of everything in the family becomes in service of the child. And I was particularly interested in those – in a with the mom and dad are both equally invested in it. And uh, it was sort of inspired by the uh, um, gold medal gymnast, Allie Reisman, who's, who's been in the press a lot lately. And her parents were sort of these oh, team yeah. players. Okay. They were famous for, were like, <laughs> exactly, that viral yeah. footage of them watching her. They became her. very famous. Yes. They became as famous as she during yes, that Yes, yeah. exactly. And that was really, the, watching them was the impetus for the book. Like, what does that do to a marriage? What does that do to, you know, siblings in the family? Because there's a sibling in the book. And um, it just seems like a kind of hot house and sort of a perfect setting for for a crime novel. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I wouldn't have necessarily thought it was a perfect setting for a crime novel, but you do because that's <laughs> yeah. the way you think. Yes. And I'm curious about the way you see almost anything that happens in the world, and catching a potential crime and thinking about who the victims might be and how you can sort of wrap things around because you don't write the same characters every book. So how does that work for you? It's really putting people under stress. I'm really interested in how people respond to, I guess, in, in cases, if they're a criminal, when they sort of lose control of, of their morality, of their sort of structures of governing themselves, you know, either desire or greed or something, you know, what that does to them. And then the people around them, um, how they endure that. Um, and that, that just always compels me. And with families, crime novels are sort of, you know, that's where your passions are the greatest or with your family. That's where secrets can really have a lot of weight, you know? So it, in some ways it's sort of the perfect scenario for, for things to go wrong. <laughs> Did you have any prodigies or, or people who are really great at anything like that in your family or in the friends, families, or where did that? Yeah, well, my brother was from. a very successful young, young, as a young person, baseball player, and so I was a, a year younger, and I was sort of the kid in the stands that would have to go, you know, every day, all summer long, you know, we would we would miss our vacation because we didn't know if they'd get to go to the Little League World Series, you know, and so our whole life um, during most of my childhood was sort of co-opted by that, so I did I did have some sense of it. Yeah. You mentioned Allie Raceman. Of course, she's in the news recently for actual criminal elements. I mean, I, did, could you have predicted at that point that there would be some other uh, unrelated criminal element to her well, background in, in life? Well, in some ways, I mean, that the problem, you know, she was... Uh, she, uh, Sexual assault. Yeah, she alleges she, that, and 140 girls now, I think, allege that this doctor had um, had taken advantage of them. And that is, had, there were a lot of whispers of that. When I was doing research, I heard a lot of stories about that. Um, so it was definitely something bubbling in the field. And I think that's what, you know, these are high pressure situations people are kind of really sort of lose sight um, of, you know, protecting often these young athletes. And we've seen it time and again. Um, they're winning girls. The, they're little girls. Little I, girls. Mean, these, yeah, I mean, these gymnasts. Yeah, and they're just, you know. Completely they're, vulnerable, And they're, these are really cloistered communities, these gymnast communities. And I think they, in some ways they protect their own, you know. And, and, you know, and I guess other examples would be private schools or churches where all these other scandals are brewing where, you know, no one wants to, um, well, no one wants to blow the lid off of it until finally somebody does. Yeah. You, you also, in each chapter, many of the chapters at least, you're quoting Nadia Comaneci, the famous Romanian gymnast from 1976, I think it was. Yeah. I mean, it was a long time ago now. Um, who I grew up with and I remember really well, but some of those things that she writes are really kind of beautiful, these these kind of opening comments that you use from Nadia. Yeah, she had this really strong voice in her memoir and, and that's where the title of the book actually comes from because at the beginning of the book, it's called Letters to a Young Gymnast and she says, I don't know you, but you will know me. And yeah. then that's how she kind of writes. It's very powerful, um, you know, very, very Eastern European um, and dramatic um, and kind of heartbreaking. So um, she 
sort of became the she was the first gymnast that I ever saw on national international stage. So she always remained in my head too. Yeah. And she uh, like you find inspiration in all these unusual places, yeah. and here you are knowing so much about gymnastics and Nadia Comaneci and all these other elements too. Yes, and I can lack no al athletic capacity. <laughs> That's funny. Not, yeah, That's really I can't funny. do anything. <laughs> well, you are like writing a lot of amazing female protagonists, and you've really sort of been one of those leaders in that world of crime fiction and women's crime fiction specifically. I mean, you have people like Gillian Flynn and you yeah. have Paula Hawkins and uh, Laura Lipman, who I know you've talked about as, a, as somebody who's influenced you. But what, as someone who's now in that group, who's mm -hmm. kind of opening doors for others and sort of paving the way, that must also be a sort of a responsibility for you. It fe yeah, it definitely feels like it. Um, it feels exciting. I mean, I think that, I mean, I've heard the argument made that the crime novels become the new social novel, that a lot of literary fiction doesn't deal with things like you know, gender relationships, domestic abuse, divorce, sort of family turmoil, but you see it in crime fiction, especially crime fiction by a lot of these women that you just named. And so it feels like a really exciting moment. And so I think there is a tradition in our community of mentorship and trying to help each other. And I, we don't see each other as competitors, but actually as part of this uh, exciting project. Yeah, and it's, we talked about women protagonists, but it's crossing boundaries. It's not like your audience is all women. There seems to be a real hunger for a variety of different storytelling or you know protagonists now you know I and it seems so. to be really popular you look at Paula Hawkins exploding and everything that's happening it's certainly not just to female readers although i think crime fiction is there are certainly a lot of women that are reading crime fiction. Yes, it's sort of historically been dominated in true crime as well by female readers or female women by the most books, period. So I guess that's part of it. But uh, often I do find I have a lot of male readers and they're really interested in, I guess, sort of this morally ambiguous terrain that I think crime fiction can get into where there are no easy answers. We live in a world now where I think um, we feel like things are pretty complicated and maybe it's good for books to reflect that in yeah. some way. Well, and so your success continues. You've had all these bestsellers, and then the door came knock, and then they started knocking on your door for, for television now. Yes. I mean, such a big jump. So for people that maybe haven't seen it, the, the Deuce is a new series on HBO. It's mm -hmm. one season in. I think they're working on the second season mm -hmm. right now, which is always great HBO stuff. They always plow forward. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's James Franco, Maggie Gyllenhaal, uh, David Simon, who everybody knows from The Wire, and who pulled in a lot of writers for The Wire. And he's pulled you in now, yes. along with people like George Pelicanos, who wrote for The Wire 2, and yep. Richard Price. Um, what's the difference in writing for television, and what's it been like for that series? It's very different. Um, it's, you know, you're in that writer's room, and, you, you know, I'm used to spending all my time by myself at my computer, you know, typing my little pages. Um, and instead, I'm in the room with these sort of big, tough guys and we argue all day long about story you know and ideas and character and the subject matter of the show is uh you know the sex industry in new york in the 1970s so it's it's pretty complicated stuff um and it's sort of you know they wanted some female writers so they brought lisa lots another another crime novelist and myself in and our job really is to to make sure that female voices are represented on the show and that these characters are are, are rich um and so it involves often a lot of arguing. So, <laughs> so that, but I guess that's my question. If you remember The Wire, it was really male-dominated writing, and it was a really tough sort of masculine show. But The Wire does have these wonderful, warm characters. It's about the porn industry, but Maggie Gyllenhaal brings a real humanity to yes. it. They knew that they needed women writers. What's it like sort of mixing with that, you know, that other side, that Wire-ish kind of group? Like Richard Price and yes. George Pelicanos and, and David Simon. Yeah, I think it definitely created a lot of crackling energy in the room and in the scripts because this, there was this col collision of the stories. You know, David and David Simon and George Pelicanos, they wanted to tell a different story. They didn't want to do what they'd done before, and I think they wanted that. Um, and so I think the show has a different feel. There's a little more humor in it, perhaps, than The Wire. Not, there are, is, are funny moments on The Wire, but it's maybe not famous for that. But this is sort of um, – it's, and it's definitely populated by a lot of – strong female characters who some are some are good maybe some who are not so good and I think that 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 energy and vitality is really exciting and I think that that's what David wanted and it's you know it's great to contribute to you know a, a broader picture are you actually in the room all together I mean you hear this writer's room right I have this smoky vision in my head <laughs> yeah. are you really in there like all working on it together yeah we, we we meet for these short bursts you know a week or two at a time but we're in there all day you know we eat lunch together you know we you know talk about you know 
pornography <laughs> together <laughs> because we have to, yeah. you know, the research is extensive. Uh, um, and, and, you know, it's my first really deep dive into um, 70s porn. So, um, so it, you know, it, it's, it's lively, but it is exhausting too. And by the end of the day, I just want to crawl on a ball under my bed. Yeah. You know? There was a joke at one of the crime uh, fiction or, or mystery thriller conventions and things that I've gone to where if they ever looked at the hard drive, you know, when you're traveling, you know, as you're getting <laughs> yeah. onto a plane or something, the stuff that you have to research yeah. has absolutely nothing to do with the human being that you are on a day-to-day -day basis, but you're like looking at the top secrets of America, you know, like yeah. literally stuff that can put you in jail. In yes, how to hide a body is right. like the <laughs> most common. Like, what, can you hide a body, uh, you know, in in a ceiling under a ceiling panel? Can you, you know, like yeah. how when does it begin to smell? I mean, this is awful things, <laughs> and you have to look at really often things you don't really want to look at. So, you know, I mean, maybe it's a really great alibi if you were a crime writer and you wanted to commit a crime because if they found anything in your search history. You could, yeah. you could, you you're, heard it here you're, first. You're a gymnastic expert. You're a porn <laughs> yeah, expert. That's right. You're like multi-talented, right, Megan yeah. Abbott. A renaissance pretty, woman. You're pretty impressive. <laughs> um, so when you, we talked a little bit about the mystery thriller community and the sort of help and support that you received from that group and that you're now giving to others as well. What is it about that community, which does seem so tight, so willing to help, so willing to mingle with your readers in other ways that, you know, you don't necessarily always see in literature. Yeah, I think part of it is, you know, you're, you know, generally we're coming into crime fiction because we were voracious crime fiction readers. And crime fiction readers, like a lot of genre readers, read all the time. Um, they're just hungry for, you know, people that, you know, like Laura Lippmann or someone who writes a series, everyone's always waiting for the next one in the series. So they think there's this, um, you know, we've definitely are one of our own readers, you know. We are, we are that reader who wants the next book. So I think... Um, there's this, there's not a competition. Instead, it seems like there's room for everybody and there's not just one stop, you know, uh, top at the spot, top at the spot. <laughs> um, <Tough>. yes, <laughs> yes. So I think that that sort of, um, doesn't have the rivalry that you hear about sometimes in other, in other communities. And instead this sort of spirit of generosity, which is very nice. Um, and we also all like kind of dark, strange stuff, and yet we found each other. So I think that's part of it, too. We don't have to justify, you know, how many Dateline NBCs yeah. <laughs> that we've watched, you know, and that we've followed the BTK, you know, killer case, <laughs> you know. We don't have to sort of make excuses for it amongst each other. Yeah, so you you write about different characters, each book standalone, but there are others that really find these iconic characters and continue to mind them, like, like Jack Reacher and yes. Lee Child series and things where each book they're trying to find a new angle about Jack and, and really they get to know this character as well as anybody in their family. Um, probably as well as they know themselves yes. in some cases. You, you've you not done that. What What is it about you and wanting to find new characters for each book? Yeah, I guess I, uh, I really, research is really something I love. Um, I like finding a world that I haven't entered before. And um, I kind of, I, that's a, the novelty of it is kind of big for me. So I think I would personally, though I love reading them, would be, would get bored quickly with the same world and the same character. Um, also, my characters tend to be, um, they're not, particularly heroic so they don't really you know they really wouldn't continue onward in, in a kind of quest like jack reacher does yeah. um good midwestern <laughs> stock i know like megan abbott yeah. i know yeah. i mean I, I've, I've thought about it but my characters are kind of depleted at the end of the book <laughs> if they're still alive so they're all so, done yeah. they're all done with you exactly yeah they probably tell you that i'm done yeah, now it's yeah time for you to go. We, we had enough megan yeah. <laughs> right. so go back to the young megan abbott the one who is beginning to read and write i know that you have an english background and, and that's where you kind of jumped in. What were the books when you were younger that sort of maybe opened your eyes to this as a career or that you just loved to read even before you knew what you wanted to do that really sort of yeah. said, this is a, there's some, something there for me. Uh, you know, I always read everything as a kid and, and I certainly read, uh, you know, Encyclopedia Brown are the ones that would be closest to a, you know, a crime I, novel. I'm a right? huge fan of the Encyclopedia greatest. Brown and it was always Bugs Meany. Oh, Bugs Meany, you know, yes, and the absolutely. Tigers. Yeah. Uh, I mean that, you know, and that felt like, I guess reading mysteries as a kid, you feel like, as a kid, you always feel like things are being hidden from you and, you know, secret knowledge is being taken from you. And so I loved reading those even as a kid. That later led to, you know, Nancy Drew and Agatha Christie and then, you know, and then eventually to darker stuff like James Elroy and Elmore Leonard, um, you know, so it was sort of a natural path. I read everything, but, but crime fiction is the one I always kept returning to. Really? So even as a younger person, that was sort of where your playground. Yes, yeah. yes. Even true 
true crime. I was a weird kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so James Elroy and and um, Elmore Leonard, there's a so, sort of a hard boiled similarity to them. Yeah. Um, but for you, you layered that hard boiled thing on sort of domestic situations. Did you sort of know that was your path to take the sort of a domestic noir, I guess. I don't even know if that's a genre, but it seems like sort of that's where you you play. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I guess um, it, you know, it felt like it felt like the less trod on terrain. You know, it's LA, not the mean we, streets of L.A. or Detroit. That's right. Or, yeah. we, we've we've done that, and there are people who can do it better than me. But I feel like the you know, I grew up in suburban Detroit, and and that's a world that to me is pretty complicated place, and you know, filled with secrets. You know, as we all know, it's sort of the blue velvet thing that behind the placid facade of the suburbs. Like all kinds of stuff and so felt felt like a good place to to find new stories and so far it has yeah, yeah. it's been very successful certainly you will know me the, the reviews have been spectacular congratulations Thank you. and the book is a real thought-provoking look at family and prodigies and gymnastics and things that I didn't know that I was as interested in as I am <laughs> though I certainly was with you following Ellie Raisman's family during that yes. whole thing so. yes. but it's really cool to meet you Megan My Abbott, pleasure. thanks so much for joining us Thank at the Mind so Book Thank you so much. Fair. Thank yeah. you. All right, everybody, there's lots more today, so please stick around. This is Rich Folly. I'm Rich Folly. You're at the Miami Book Fair 2017, and you're watching PBS Books. Watching PBS Books. Watching PBS Books. Watching PBS Books.